Hi, everybody. This is uh, Silvio Canto in Dallas, Texas, on Wednesday, April 19th. And today we're going to chat with our good friend Marcos Nelson Suarez, and we're going to re- remember uh, an extremely important episode in recent history. And I'm talking about the Mariel uh, boat lift in, that began at this time in 1980, April 1980. It obviously went on for a lot more time, but it sort of all exploded uh, this month, although, as we will see, uh, as we will hear from Marcos Nelson, there were a lot of things that set this up. This was not a just something that happened in one day. It was really a perfect storm that was building for quite some time in Cuba, going back almost five years before the actual Mariel incident uh, in 1980. Now, for people like me, and I've said this many times, I've said this in my book, and I've said this every time that the topic of Cuba comes up, for someone like me who came here in the 1960s, uh, we often we often got disconnected from Cuba, not on purpose, not because we didn't want to talk about Cuba. It just sort of happened. Uh, the more, especially the more we began to live outside of our home with our parents and so on, and went to the university and started working Throu- throughout the 1970s. Let's just pretty much say that during the 1970s, I had very little to do with Cuba. Uh, even Cuban music, I would listen to it because I always loved it. But it, it, it just, the topic of Cuba, I could, would often go maybe weeks without thinking of Cuba or even talking about Cuba. Again, I wasn't avoiding it. It was just that it wasn't part of my routine. Then in the spring of 1980, like a lot of people, I flip on the television, and then you see these scenes of people leaving Cuba. And that's when it really kind of... Uh, it just hit me between the eyes, and I said, folks, what is going on in Cuba? And at that moment, it's almost like something lit up inside of me, and I've had a tremendous interest in Cuba ever since. So, again, for me, Mariel was a turning point of reconnecting myself with this island that I had left years before when I was 12. And uh, so this topic of Mariel every year always uh, forces me to, to remember that uh, particular period. Just wanted to make a quick note uh, about the election in Georgia. We're going to get into it more in a future show. But I think there are lessons here for both parties. For the Democrats, the lesson is you have to do more than run against Trump. At some point, you got to tell people what you stand for, not that you hate Trump. If you keep running, I hate Trump, I don't think that's going to do it. And for the Republicans, I think there's a wake-up call as well. And that wake-up call is you better do what you promised. Obamacare and some of these other issues, because there will be surprises in 2018 if the Republicans don't do what they have to do, and there will be surprises against the Democrats if they keep on doing what what cost them so many elections during the Obama years. So there's lessons for both parties, and as I say, we'll get into it a lot more in a future program. Let me say hello to my good friend uh, Marcos Nelson Suarez, who lives here in North Texas. Uh, Marcos Nelson, welcome to the show. It's really a great honor. I've been looking forward to this topic for some time, and it's really nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you. The same. It's an honor to be here. All right. Well, why don't we begin uh, by simply, if you could share with us a little bit about you, uh, when you left Cuba, and, uh, you know, what, what you've done since you've left Cuba. You're, it's interesting. I should note that that you and I are a few years apart, not, not that much of a difference, but obviously we had different experiences. I didn't, you know, I didn't live in Cuba in the 60s and 70s like you did. So it's interesting how we have a different experience. So talk about yourself and how you got to to the United States, uh, and then we'll get into Mariel. Well, I am a Marielito. I, <laughs> I live uh, through the experience, the tumultuous month that uh, culminated with the exodus. And I came on a boat, uh, a boat that had capacity for about 35 people, and we were about 130. And of course, I ended up in Miami. And after two or three years of moving here and moving there and adjustment, I finally uh, came uh, to North Texas for a job uh, at a Hispanic newspaper. Uh, two years after that, I started my own newspaper, and I have been in media uh, since I uh, since that day until I retired about six years ago. 
Yes. And He's, that newspaper is one of the most successful newspapers here in Dallas. I think we should, we need to say that. Um, well, yeah. Hispanic I mean, sense. we, yeah. El Hispano News. El Hispano News, yeah. It's a very successful newspaper. You see it. You see it everywhere. And you also write from time to time in El Hispano News, right? You write some columns? That's correct. Uh, uh, yeah, I from time to time I touch in Spanish, of course. As you can see, uh, you can hear by my macaronic English. <laughs> this is not my <laughs> my best language, but I try. No, you do well. You do well. Listen, um, some of us were lucky to come here and sort of pick it up because we were kids, you know. Uh, I've always had yes. a great deal of respect. I, I've always had a great deal of respect for people like you who had to come here and learn the language as an adult. And I know that it's always a lot more complicated to learn it as an adult. Well, what do we, let's go to uh, the, the event of Mariel. I mentioned that it, it, it exploded for, for, many, for, for those of us in the outside. It exploded this month, actually this week in 1980. But as you and I were talking before off the air, there were some things going on in Cuba that I think sort of made this a perfect storm. So why don't we talk about those two or three things that you feel were happening in Cuba that resulted in, in the events of April 1980, Michael Nelson? Well, with the, by the 1970s, at the beginning of the 1970s, let's face it, the Cuban regime has uh, successfully uh, been able to subsist against an invasion sponsored by the United States. I'm talking about Bayou Peaks. Uh, the whole transformation of the Cuba society and the Cuban economy in a socialist uh, model somehow copy from what was happening in Eastern Europe uh, led to a feeling of uh, resignation. Uh, most Cubans that at that point really didn't support the regime, but we don't have another option. I mean, the only open option there was to try to escape risking three, five, six years in prison if we were caught, getting in a boat and trying to uh, come to the United States. And it was very difficult and it was very dangerous. And people like me, uh, young people at the time, uh, really want to get out of there, but you see how difficult it is. So we reached a point where resignation was the... the general feeling. We cannot fight against the, uh, this already. You know, in the 60s, it was a big fight in the mountains in the center of Cuba, and it was unsu uh, unsuccessful. Uh, so there was no hope until the United States, and until Carter took power, Jimmy Carter took power in the United States, and started negotiating with the Cuban government, uh, trying to do the same thing that Mr. Obama did uh, uh, before uh, the end of, of, of his term. Now, when that happened, several Latin American countries, including Argentina, Peru, uh, Panama, uh, I believe Colombia, when they saw the United States talking to Cuba, they said, well, why don't we do the same? And they start reestablishing relationships, diplomatic relationships with Cuba, meaning they also open embassies. And because treaties between Latin American countries, as you are aware of, uh, Latin American uh, embassies are obligated by treaty to offer political asylum and refuge to people who feel that, that they are prosecuted. So what we start seeing there is that once the embassies were open, and embassies at that time were protected like Fort Knox, I mean, they have Cuban soldiers outside, machine guns. They don't even allow uh, people to walk on the sidewalk where the embassy was located. But then people start jumping into the embassies, and all of this kind of precipitate by uh, December 1979 when uh, a bus carrying 12 people entered by force, uh, pushed their way through the Peruvian embassy in Havana, 
provoking the soldiers to shoot. One of the uh, soldiers shoot the other. And the Cuban government requests that the embassy return the people that were looking for asylum, uh, qualifying them as criminals. The Peruvian uh, government refused, sitting, citing the, uh, uh, the, the right of asylum treaty. And on April 4, the Cuban government announced in the media that uh, the, uh, from this point on, the protection of the Peruvian embassy will be left in the hands of the Peruvian officials. Right. And what happened was historic. Mm-hmm. In 36 hours, 10,800 people went into the Peruvian embassy in Havana looking for asylum. So me, that was me, the ca- Yeah. Let me I'm just sorry. jump in because I, I no, that's all right. I, I just wanted to jump in because I wanted to fill in uh, some information or to put more context into the story. Because just as, as that had happened, uh, just as the, as the 10,800 Cubans had gone into the Peruvian embassy, the situation became so tense and it was such an international problem that President Carter was, was forced to issue a statement basically calling – on the Cuban government to protect uh, or, or for everyone to be concerned about the safety of these individuals. This is a, a really extraordinary thing for an American president to do such a thing, to, to issue a statement. But that's because this whole Mariel incident, and this is why it's also important to remember, was happening in the middle of presidential primaries back here in the United States. And during these primaries, as the situation in Cuba with Mariel was developing, President Carter was getting a lot of criticism from many of the Republicans who were running in the primaries, uh, names that you'll recognize, like Ronald Reagan, like George Bush, uh, like uh, Bob Dole, uh, Howard Baker, men like that who were running for president on the Republican side. And they were being very tough on President Carter, saying that we have to do something, we have to do something. And that's, uh, I just wanted to put that in because I think it is extraordinary that this was happening in Cuba at a time when there was a political climate up here, Marcos. I, I just wanted to throw that in and put that into the timeline, please. Go, go ahead. Well, l- let me add some other TV there. Remember that the Cuban uh, and, uh, and the U.S. government were talking about, you know, reestablishing uh, r- relationships. And in fact, they opened what uh, uh, until about, a year ago was the uh, interest section that was held in the Swiss embassy. And the reason why the talks collapsed is because a few years uh, before, I am not sure it was 76 or 75, the Cuban government, in the middle of these talks with the U.S. government, intervened in the war of Angola that the United States and both the United States and the Soviet Union uh, we are using proxies uh, to protect their interests and, and, and trying to move the balance in favor of one of another, according to whoever will take power there. And Cuba was able to move uh, that balance in favor of the communist uh, 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 part of the guerrilla warfare in, uh, in Angola. That was the reason why we didn't have, I mean, the U.S. didn't have uh, uh, diplomatic right. relations with, with Cuba. That's that right. was the another point. Yeah, that was another point. And, and I think that in all fairness to President Carter, uh, the President Carter who initiated the talks with, uh, with Fidel Castro in 77 or whatever, by, by 1980, President Carter, I think, had learned a few very tough lessons like Afghanistan <laughs> when the Soviets, yes. you know, when the Soviets went into Afghanistan, when the embassy in Tehran was taken over. So the, the yes. President Carter, by this time in 1980, President Carter uh, was a different person, really, politically. He understood that, that in the past maybe he had been naive or whatever, and uh, the, he, his whole approach was different by this time. You may, you may not know this because you were not living in the United States at the time, but in, in 1980, after, uh, after uh, the Soviets went into Afghanistan, President Carter, in a national speech, uh, in the State of the Union speech in 1980, in, in January or February of 1980, 
threatened to use military force to defend American interest against Soviet expansion. That was the first time that he had ever been that tough with the Soviets. So I, I bring all of this to, to put some context into a story that is very complicated. So now we have a situation where the embassy is, is full of people, and then Castro, I believe, goes on national television and says, que se vayan, or something like that. Go leave the country if you want to. Yes. And then that begins. But I'm interested in one thing. Before we get to, to, to that story, just tell me a little bit about you uh, in the middle of all of this. Just kind of fill in what you were doing uh, as you saw people in an embassy, as you saw your friends, because uh, you mentioned to me off the air that you didn't live too far from, I think, the Argentina embassy. So just kind of give me a, a, a little story of, of what you were going through at that moment. Well, uh, it's interesting that you ask that because I was in Havana because I am from a small town uh, south of uh, Havana. But on, a, in, on April 4th, I was in, I was in uh, the capital. I, I read the uh, little note on the newspaper, and I say, no, 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 this has to be some type of trick by the government. The, who knows what a scheme they are doing because this could not happen. And I went back to my town. And then I found out that people were going into, into, into the embassy. But that time, it was too late. Already the government have surrounded the Peruvian embassy. They put a cordon around 20, 20 or 30 blocks of the embassy and stopped the flood. Look, this was an extraordinary event inside Cuba in particular. I mean, people were going to Havana with bags. And I am talking a million people, two million people. They were being arrested by the hundreds, by the thousands trying to get into the embassy, and then some other people start trying to get into, into the Costa Rica embassy. And I was one of them. I went with two friends. This was about 72, 80 hours after uh, the beginning of the entrance to the Peruvian embassy that, that like I said before, last just 36 hours. Uh, and I remember that I am walking uh, two or three blocks from the embassy, and of course I am with two friends. I am looking at, you know, what is happening, what is the the, the, the environment around these embassies. And you see this guy over there reading a newspaper, and the other one is smoking uh, against a tree. And then in front of us, I remember two or three people, I don't remember exactly the number, tried to enter the Costa Rica embassy. And immediately all these people that weren't reading papers, doing nothing, jump over them. So, I mean, people stopped going to work. I don't know how to explain, but it was something really incredible what was happening in Cuba. And to me, more important... And I believe that it was the, 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 the slogan that the Western media used to reflect this is people in Cuba were bo boring with their feet. Because Cuba at, at that time was about six, seven million people. And when you have two million people coming from the Oriental provinces and going into, <laughs> into Havana with bags and everything, thinking finally I'm going to leave, that's extraordinary. That is, it was, it was actually, uh, it was very embarrassing too, uh, internationally for Castro, because it, as you say, people were voting with their feet and, and you had people trying to desperately get out. I mean, on one hand, they're telling us how happy everybody is. And then on the other hand, as soon as they have a chance, they're trying to get out of the country. So for Fidel Castro and for many of his apologists, it was really a, a very, very tough situation. Let me ask you one more question about the Peruvian embassy. And then we'll talk about how Mariel impacted the revolution. Uh, 10,800 people in an embassy, I'm assuming the embassy was just a house. Uh, you know, the, the, it most, was just a embassy. house. I mean, it was just a house in, a, in, uh, uh, in one of the you know, high class, of former, former high class neighborhood. Nothing too big. I mean, uh, you have people 
uh, sitting on the branch of the trees, people eating uh, leaves. I mean, it was chaos. I mean, it was right. absolute. I mean, and, and, and then again, you have families, you have uh, the kids, uh, all people. I mean, every type of people were there. And and, and, remember... and also is and, and sorry. No. Also, it's very important to point out that the 1980 exodus, uh, and you know there were uh, they, they, there were three or four exodus in Cuba. In in in, in uh, first, you know, the rich people, the middle high class. Then in the 60s, just the middle class. This was regular folks. I mean. Uh, nobody with money, uh, no people with, uh, you know, university degrees, things like that. This time, it was the regular Cuban population. Right. They were supposed to be the beneficiaries of the revolution. Exactly. As, as they like to tell you. But but I, I just, uh, some in the audience, uh, if you want to see some real video of what was happening in the Peruvian embassy, there are some available in YouTube. Uh, some of the news reports from that time, so you can actually get a sense of how chaotic the situation was. Well, let me do this. Let me, can, can we take a break? Can I have you back for a few more minutes? Because I want to develop on the next topic of how Mariel changed Cuba. Can you can you wait for a few minutes while I take a break? Sure. Sure. Let's do that. Thank we're you. gonna take we're gonna take a little break, and then when we come back, we'll continue our conversation about Mariel, 1980. This is Carlos Kelly's Heartbeat, and I would like to see you guys this Saturday night at No Brasserie Authentic Cajun and Creole Restaurant, located at 1201 Main Street, downtown Dallas. I'll be performing instrumental high-energy jazz at 7.30 until midnight, so make your reservation today at 469-872-1820. I have to tell you, I have to put a plug here for Carlos. He's a great friend of our show. He lets us use his music. The music you hear on the show is Carlos Guedes' uh, original music. Uh, this event that he does on Saturday nights, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the food is great and the music is great. So if you want to do something fun on a Saturday night, take your wife, uh, your kids or whatever, it's a great atmosphere. There's lots of parking, so don't worry about parking. And uh, it's just great. I mean, I, I, simply, uh, I, I simply tell you, Take your wife, take your girlfriend, take your kids, whatever, to NOLA on Saturday nights, and I think you're going to enjoy some, some great music. Let's get back to Marcos Nelson Suarez, who, as, as he himself said, he was a, a Marielito. And uh, it's interesting. I, I laugh when I say that, Marcos, because a, a Marielito who, you know, Marielito who been here 37 years, you have been here longer than, than people who didn't leave through Mariel. <laughs> It, it's just a, it, it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating idea, you know. But let's talk a little bit about how Mariel changed uh, the 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 so-called revolution. I always hate to use the word revolution. I prefer to use dictatorship. How, how it changed the dictatorship. Uh, you know, people say revolution. It, it, it's too romantic, and when you you know, I don't. There's nothing. But anyway, I prefer to call it the dictatorship because that's what it is, la dictadura. Now, uh, I remember after. Mariel, or a few years later, that Carlos Franchi, who had been part of the original movement, had been, I think, the editor of Juventud uh, Rebelde or, or a newspaper in Cuba, made a Revolucion. documentary, Revolucion. He made a documentary, uh-huh. and he, he interviewed several people in that documentary, and he mentioned how, how this moment, Mariel had really basically disenchanted so many supporters, including... Uh, a lady by the name of Aide, Aide Santa Maria. We don't know, you know, when a person commits suicide, we don't know all the facts, and, and I don't want to speculate. But in the in the documentary, Carlos Franchi clearly suggests that she had become so disillusioned with Cuba that she could no longer take it, and suggested that maybe that's why she took her life. Give me your thoughts on how how Mariel changed Cuba. Uh, you know, for for you and and so many others like you who left. Look, the way I qualify this is that there are two Cubas, and and I am talking about after 1959. 
after Castro took power. It's Cuba before 1980 and Cuba after 1980. And now that you mentioned the documentary, and every time that I think of this, believe me, I get a lump on my thread. In that documentary in particular, uh, by the way, that was sponsored by the uh, uh, Italian television, uh, they interviewed this 11-year-old kid who explained, in, you know, with the innocent proper of that age, how when in his school, in his primary school, he, uh, the teachers and everybody knew that he and his family were leaving the country. Uh, the teacher put him in front of all other students in the patio of the school. And as you well know, uh, uh, kids in Cuba has to wear a little pin with the pictures of uh, Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos. And they have, uh, I don't know how to say it in, 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 in uh, English, the red and white um, Pañoleta. Um, right. How yeah, you it's, like, it's like, well, it's like around their neck, you mean. It's there like, a, uh, I know what you mean. I can't think of the word either, but it's a handkerchief, but it's not. It, exactly. It, you, you put, yeah. yeah, you yeah. put it around your neck, but uh, I know I know what you I know what you mean. It's like something around your neck. Yeah. In red and red and white colors. Yes. Go ahead. Exactly. So this teacher uh, put him in front of the rest of the students and said, OK, this is a traitor to his country. I mean, that's to an 11 year old boy. And he ripped the. Uh, the pañoleta, the handkerchief out of his uh, neck, and the pin, and you don't have the right to wear these symbols of the revolution. Uh, I, I know that in words it's very hard uh, to visualize something like this, but to me this is so horrible that to an 11-year-old kid, you're, I mean, you're going to call an 11-year-old kid a traitor to your country. Right. Uh, this is my personal feeling when I say that mm -hmm. there is Cuba before and after 1980. Who, during all this month of the Mariel Bolif that lasted more or less before, uh, between May 1980 and September 1980, when 125,000 people were able to uh, leave the country, uh, what what most people didn't witness because news uh, cars were not allowed to go into the country is how even if you if you were a university student, they gonna put lines of other students, member of their uh, youth uh, communist organization, and you have to walk like a block with all these people hitting you, throwing rockets uh, at, at you, getting you naked. Uh, your house was surrounded by mobs. The water was cut, the electricity was cut, and a lot of people were hurt, even with machetes. Uh, some people were killed. So my personal view is that until that incident in 1980, even if I didn't agree with it, I think that, okay, you believe different than me, that's fine. You believe that this uh, dictatorship is a better way for the future. Okay, that's your choice. But after witnessing all of this, if you still believe in that system, I don't know what to call you. Because naive you right. are not. You are seeing the monstrosities and the atrocities mm -hmm. that have been committed against other people that the only thing that they want is get out of the country. Exactly. They want to leave fact, this paradise uh, to you. Okay, <laughs> so right. so I cannot believe that honestly you can still have faith in a system capable of such monstrosities. Absolutely. That's my personal no, point of view. No, no, and, and I and I I'll never forget the, the very first time I met you, which I think was 1989. Uh, I remember you mentioning this to me because we talked about it. It always stuck with me the way you explained it, because I think you're exactly right. The way I put it is the romance was gone at that point. Whatever existed, whatever romance existed, it went out the window at that point because anybody who didn't see what that was uh, was either blind or, or whatever. That was a, a, a dictatorship of the, worst, of the worst kind. I'm going to close going back to the Carlos Franchi documentary 
and bringing back a scene at the very beginning uh, when the ships are coming in from Cuba and in, in dialogue that was happening on the ships. And a couple of men were talking to each other, or maybe they were talking to the media, I don't know. And they were basically saying in Spanish, mentiras, puras mentiras y más mentiras, meaning lies, pure lies, and more lies. And these were people talking about the Castro dictatorship, and that always stuck with me. Uh, lies, more lies, and pure lies. And that's the, the best way to describe this uh, dictatorship that hopefully will someday uh, be, uh, be history rather than, than a part of Cuba. Uh, Marco, I want to make a point, if I can, just, just for a few seconds. Yeah, go ahead. Look, go ahead. the Castro has been in power almost for, for, for 60 years. For people who don't know about this system, and they ask what the hell they don't revolt and uh, change the government, remember that in no communist country in history, no one, the change has ever come from the population up. Every change happened from the top down. And, and what that means is that the level of terror and the level of repression is such that change, like in, a, in any regular dictatorship, is impossible. Absolutely. No, and that's, and that's one of the best points that, uh, you know, we can make because when you look at, uh, for example, other countries like the Philippines, you know, with Marcos was replaced and, and other countries, there was a heck of a lot more freedom in those countries. I mean, for, I mean, going back to Cuba, for example, during the Batista, the Batista years, the New York Times had a bureau in Cuba. Other newspapers had bureaus in Cuba and they could report. I'm not saying that there wasn't some level of censorship, but certainly – under the Castro government, there was, there was total, complete censorship. Michael Nilsson, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, very kind of you to join us and share with, with us your very unique experience. And uh, I guess we'll just have to follow this up. Let's get together for lunch one of these days again, like, like we do once in a while. But I want to thank you so much for your time and, and my very best to you and to your family. And I really, really, really appreciate it everything you said today, because it, it was just absolutely great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Marcos Nelson Suarez, uh, who, as he himself said, a Marielito, and I was joking about that, not joking, but thinking about that, that a Marielito has now been in the United States 37 years, which means uh, that he's been here longer now than many, many Cubans, including my own family, some members who left uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. So, 37 years, that is a long time, but yet sometimes memories will stick with you. And, and this one with me has always been one of those memories that you just cannot, uh, that you cannot put away. Thank you for listening. This is uh, Silvio Canto in Dallas. Have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you later. <laughs>